Bé, bona tarda a tothom. Em dic Eduard Salvador, soc catedràtic de Física de la Universitat de Barcelona i en aquesta ocasió faré d'anfitrió de la professora Lisa Randall. Potser no necessita presentació, és una persona que tots vosaltres la deveu conèixer probablement, però de tota manera m'agradaria dir unes quantes paraules per centrar més el personatge. Bé, com ja deveu saber, la professora Lisa Randall és catedràtica de física teòrica de la Universitat de Harvard. De fet, ha passat per les millors universitats, ja començant per Berkeley, que va estar de postdoc, després a Princeton, ja com a catedràtica, i a MIT, i finalment a Harvard, on va estudiar de fet. I bé, és una científica de primera línia. El seu camp de treball és la física de partícules i la connexió amb cosmologia. I ha escrit més d'una centena, de fet, prop de 150 articles científics del més alt nivell en el camp de la física de partícules. Concretament, ha fet treballs molt importants des del model supersimètric, passant per les dimensions extres de l'univers, la variogènesi, és a dir, la formació dels elements massius que hi ha a l'univers. També ha treballat sobre la inflació, és a dir, l'expansió accelerada de l'univers amb una fracció molt petita després de l'anomenat Big Bang i també en la composició de la matèria fosca, que és bàsicament el tema o una de les, diguéssim, possibles implicacions que pot tenir la matèria fosca és el tema del llibre, el darrer llibre de divulgació que ha fet la professora Randall, que es titula la matèria oscura i los dinosaurios, traduït com els seus llibres anteriors per editorial El Acantilado. I precisament amb aquesta presentació d'aquesta traducció se'ns dona l'oportunitat de conversar amb ella. Estava dient que ha fet contribucions de primer ordre a nivell científic, D'altra banda, cal dir també que a nivell de formació té un currículum molt extens. Ja a part de com a professora de la universitat ha format nombrosos doctors, té participacions també nombroses a congressos, ha donat seminaris, ha donat conferències a moltes universitats de tot el món. És a dir, que no hi ha dubte que a nivell científic estem davant d'una primera figura, però és que, a més a més, com ja deveu saber molts de vosaltres, una característica especial de la professora Randall és que, a més a més de dedicar-se a fer ciència, considera molt important fer divulgació. I, a més d'escriure aquests quatre llibres als que em referia abans de divulgació, doncs ha fet intervencions contínues en tots els mitjans de comunicació. És una invitada assídua a aquests shows de la televisió americana, però no solament els shows de la televisió americana, també a televisions de tot el món. En particular, també ha participat en el programa Redes aquí a Espanya. I ha estat objecte de molts articles de premsa i de revistes, fins i tot perquè realment ha sabut connectar amb el gran públic. I ja per acabar aquestes quatre idees de presentació de la doctora Randall, volia també insistir en un aspecte que potser no és tan conegut, que és que fins i tot ha escrit el libreto d'una òpera que ha tingut de fet bastant èxit, el compositor de la qual és un català, és Héctor Parra, potser n'han sentit parlar, i que va ser estrenada a París, però també ja ha estat presentada a Alemanya i aquí mateix a Barcelona. És a dir, que toca gairebé totes les tecles. 
I precisament es tracta, doncs, podríem dir, d'una persona sàvia, en el sentit estricte de la paraula, és a dir, una persona amb molts coneixements que, a més a més, els utilitza per fer avançar la societat. Aleshores, estic molt agraït a l'editorial El Acantilado, com també a Fundació Catalunya La Pedrera, per haver-me donat l'oportunitat de poder conversar amb ella en aquesta ocasió. Espero que no solament entregui el ple de saber les seves opinions sobre les qüestions que tot seguit veuran, sinó que espero que tots vostès entreguin un gran profit. O sigui que, bona tarda, professora Randall. Good evening. Bé, havia pensat construir aquesta conversa, bàsicament seran preguntes meves a la doctora Randall, suposo que estan molt més interessats a saber les seves opinions que no pas les meves al respecte, sobre uns temes que, de fet, no són gens originals. Són les grans preguntes que ens fem els científics, de sempre, però que també es fan les persones no científiques però interessades en la ciència. És a dir, que és una oportunitat de saber què en pensa la professora Randall al respecte. Aleshores, he pensat fer les preguntes en tres grans blocs. Un primer bloc sobre ciència i societat, un segon bloc sobre el pensament científic, i un tercer bloc ja més centrat en el tema d'aquest últim llibre seu. Aleshores, a veure, perquè no me n'oblidi gaires de preguntes. Començant per la ciència i la cultura, diguéssim. Bé, perquè un tema que potser la gent que no és científica no en sigui prou conscient, però els científics en són molt de conscients, és que notem que es fa una distinció molt clara, sovint, per exemple, en les llibreries o en els programes de televisió, etc., entre la cultura i la ciència. I, en canvi, els científics considerem que la nostra feina forma part de la cultura. Evidentment, no tots els aspectes de la cultura són iguals, no? O sigui, no ens hem de comparar amb un literat o un pintor. Però, de tota manera, la ciència alimenta l'esperit i és una de les activitats més importants del ser humà, igual com ho són les arts i altres aspectes i les humanitats en general. Aleshores, m'agradaria saber si aquest també és un problema que sent la doctora Randall, perquè a vegades dubto de si és un problema més específic de països amb menys tradició científica, com és el cas d'Espanya, i que potser països com els Estats Units aquesta distinció entre cultura i ciència no tingui tant... Què en diu vostè al respecte? That would be a nice world where the United States didn't have this separation. I think, if anything, it's probably worse in America in many ways. I think, you know, it's funny because... I experienced this when I wrote my first book because I would try to write, you know, because when you're writing a book about science, you want to, first of all, of course, explain the science, but, you know, that's a little bit boring for me. You know, I know the science, I'm explaining it. So you want to sort mm -hmm. of bring in other issues and mm -hmm. bring in culture, and, you know, for me, the analogies were fun because then I could bring in other things, and, you know, I would sometimes make jokes, and I, I had a friend who was editing it, and, um, and every time I made a joke, she would get annoyed because, she's, because the, she didn't understand the science well enough that she, you couldn't even tell if it was a joke. And, you know, and for me, it's so nice when you have this language and you can be fluent and it's part of your world. And the fact that science has to always, because people don't understand it, we always have to separate it and think mm -hmm. of it differently. And, it be, and so people, you know, it becomes dry, it becomes less exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but in part, it's because people aren't up to speed. I mean, one of... Uh, uh, don't want to go on too long because I know this is being translated, but you know, one of the things that happens even if you see science museums mm -hmm. versus ordinary museums, I mean, w whenever there's a science museum, it becomes a children's museum. Um, but for art, of course, we wouldn't think of it that way. And really, science is, is for adults too. In fact, once there's, there's actually a museum of mathematics that opened up near my place in New York, 
And somebody actually asked me, where is the Children's Museum? And I said, oh, you mean the Museum of Mathematics. Mm -hmm. But that's how we tend to equate it. And you know, we would have a richer society if people were, you know, had ch at least new ch child-level science so that mm -hmm. we can advance our conversations in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. Sí, porque uh, de vegades penso que potser mm, separem massa d'hora uh, una mica els gustos de, de les criatures a les escoles, no? És a dir, la gent que que de tirar cap a cap a les humanitats o cap a les arts i les persones que han de tirar cap a la ciència i la tecnologia, diguéssim, no? Les hores fa que sovint ens perdem part de, del que realment és interessant. O sigui, igual hi ha molta gent que s'ha dedicat a la ciència que el millor disfrutaria molt més tenint uns coneixements més avançats d'altres aspectes de la cultura, igual com eh, hi ha gent que es dedica a la cultura i que fins i tot a vegades agafa fins i tot por a la ciència, no, no diguem por a les matemàtiques, això ja és un, ja és un clàssic. No? Doncs... Eh, el, el, a Estats Units m'imagino que també se separa bastant, no? A nivell de, de la formació secundària, de, entre si, el, els que seguiran la carrera científica i well, el... I mean, I think the, the even worse thing, in my opinion, is that, you know, people aren't embarrassed to say, I, you know, I can't do math, I don't know any science. You know, you would be embarrassed to say you can't read. I mean, this isn't to say I'm unsympathetic. I understand some people have trouble, but you know, people know that's a problem when you can't read. Yet, if you have problems with even basic math or basic science, it's considered perfectly acceptable. And I think that's really a problem. I mean, I think we have to get to a stage where, I mean, and people, you know, they sell themselves short. They um, don't try as hard as they would otherwise. And frankly, I think it is harder for some people, and sometimes it's harder for the teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's an easy out. It's an easy way to do it, to say, oh, I don't have to worry about that. But I have to say, you know, the other thing that happens is um, science becomes, I mean, at the other end, at the higher levels, science is very specialized. And I know for mm -hmm. me, and probably for you too, when you do your work, it's, it's very hard to make time, to have time to do, uh, think about all of these other things. And so for me, it was a big decision Well, you know, I had done this work that was very important. I had, you know, had more citations than any other stuff. And I thought, and, you know, and, and I just started to write for fun. I realized it was something else that I really liked and that I hadn't been doing. So, you know, it's interesting because you only have so much time and you can't do it mm -hmm. all. But, you know, certainly at a cultural level to appreciate all these things, I think, mm -hmm. is possible. To actually do everything is, is sometimes harder. Mm -hmm. Suposo que la seva activitat divulgadora té a veure amb aquesta intenció d'apropar la ciència a un públic més general, que no pas únicament a la gent ja molt ficada en els terrenys científics, no? To some extent, I think also I have to admit that I actually just think scientists should have a bigger voice publicly. I think that you want to have a scientific opinion and I realize this was also the best route for me to be able to get involved in any other discussions as well. Mm -hmm. Hi ha una qüestió que mm, sempre m'ha picat una mica, que és precisament eh, el tema de qui creu vostè que convé que faci eh, divulgació, perquè hi ha les dues opinions, una que, que han de ser els propis científics. Sorry, I didn't hear the translation of that. Sí. Deia que... Uh, hmm. No, I can. Thank you. Deia que... Eh, M'agradaria saber la seva opinió respecte a qui creu que convé més que faci divulgació. Eh, si els propis científics o eh, gent periodista o de la comunicació, diguéssim. No? Perquè és obvi que dins dels científics hi poden haver investigadors de primer ordre, però que siguin totalment incapaços de, de poder explicar mitjanament de forma intel·ligible eh, la seva feina. No? Però, d'altra banda, eh, és possible que molts periodistes no tinguin els coneixements suficients com per... I a vegades donen unes explicacions que pretenen més aviat agradar, eh? o sigui, fer, fer uns exemples, una cosa d'aquest estil, més que realment eh, que explicar una certa teoria. Vostè què en pensa? I can tell you've had some experience. <laughs> yeah. um, well, first of all, I think any reporters who are here should definitely write about science. 
Um, but I also think that it is challenging. I mean, I, I think sometimes it, it's a little frustrating because you talk to reporters and, you know, unless you really understand the material, it's, it's hard to write well. But of course, as you say, there are many scientists who don't speak well and it, it's a lot of work. I mean, both are a lot of work. Understanding the science is a lot of work and translating the science is a lot of work. And I think a lot of time, many people don't appreciate how much that can be. So I think, you know, ideally you'd have some combination. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote a book was I realized that it's just, it's not possible in an article to explain all the subtleties, to explain everything. So, I mean, sometimes it's just an impossible challenge. Mm -hmm. And what you end up with is sort of the easier science that's easier to explain or that appeals to people more quickly. But one of the really satisfying things about writing books is how many people did appreciate that you really do go into detail, or even if not complete detail, to give the background. I mean, one of the problems with articles in general, not just about science, is you report on what happened yesterday, but you don't report the background. So unless you know the background, it's very hard to follow. And that could be true for the Syrian war, or it could be true for anything. So I think with science especially, it's just very hard to know that background yourself. So I think there is some ways in which it is essential that scientists, or at least reporters who have followed it, have kept up with it. But I think there's a danger that things can, can be oversimplified. And so mm -hmm. with everything, it's a trade-off of how many people you reach versus how um, substantive what mm -hmm. you say is. Mm -hmm. Uh, també hi ha una altra qüestió que seria uh, si realment uh, el, actualment es diu que els científics tenen l'obligació d'explicar i de divulgar. Eh? Uh, aleshores jo volia saber què creu que és més important. Uh, Tenir-ne uh, ganes i realment disfrutar amb la divulgació o sentir-se obligats Uh, jo puc entendre una mica aquesta segona versió, eh? perquè uh, els científics que només es dediquen a investigar per mi és una mica com els pintors que pintarien però que no farien mai cap exposició de les seves obres o com els literats que, que escriurien però que només uh, passarien els llibres als seus amics. No? O sigui, els científics que estem descobrint coses considero que efectivament tenim l'obligació d'extendre aquest coneixement a la societat, perquè com deia abans, els coneixements de com funciona el món, etc., formen part realment de la cultura i per tant és bo que tothom en disfruti una mica. No? Eh, però d'aquí a que tothom ho hagi de fer potser és diferent. No? Um, so I definitely do not think everyone has to do that mm -hmm. and I think we're better off if not everyone does that. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, it's when you get a PhD in, in physics or some other field, it's, there's no guarantee that you have any ability in being able to communicate it. So it's not only a waste of their time, it's a waste of your time to listen sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I also, you know, especially with younger scientists, I mean, I didn't even think about communicating to the public till I had been in the field for many years and had done very important research. And I think that was the right route because I think mm -hmm. if you Try, I mean, I have to say, since I do everything, or try to do it, it, it definitely takes a hit on your research. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, it also it broadens your perspective in many ways. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's anything wrong with scientists focusing on their science. I think that's really, I mean, that's one of the challenges to science is you have to focus so much. Mm -hmm. It's just to really make advances. I do think, however, that um, especially if we are funded by the public and uh, mm -hmm. um, I think there is some obligation that if people want to know about it they should have access to it mm -hmm. so somewhere somehow there should be access to this information of course as a scientist too it's not quite the same as just giving a book to your friends because we have a scientific community and really we're writing our papers and you know it's interesting because I'm at Harvard there's there's many people who write for the public but when they write for the public if you are not in in physics, it's really their, their research as well. So they just write their research in a way that's more accessible. I mean, for me, it's really two distinct activities. One is mm -hmm. writing papers for my colleagues and one is writing books, mm -hmm. uh, which are really translations in many ways for the mm -hmm. general public. So I think it's important that it happens. I, I don't think any individual, and, and certainly when younger people ask me, I, I tell them, don't, you know, you certainly shouldn't feel like you have. I mean, I think people think it's fun sometimes, they want to do it. But, um, and you know, it, 
as opposed to working in an office or having a very small community. I mean, it's very nice to meet a large community of people. But I think that if you do that too much, it will um, harm research. Parlem mm ara de ciència i política. Bé, de sempre s'ha dit que la ciència s'ha de mantenir al marge de la política, però tenim molts exemples del que ha passat al llarg de la història de la humanitat en què... Sorry, I'm not getting the translation again. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Doncs deia que tenim exemples de, de llarg de la història de moments en què la ciència ha acabat influint i no sempre positivament en la política o en conseqüències, per exemple, militars, etc. etc. No? Aleshores, eh, però d'altra banda, darrerament ens adonem que potser eh, la ciència hauria d'intervenir en temes tan importants com el canvi climàtic, si més no, a nivell de donar la seva opinió o esperant que els polítics els demanin l'opinió als científics d'algunes de les actuacions o decisions que s'han de prendre, no? o bé eh, la sostenibilitat. Vostè creu que, que ens hauríem d'involucrar més o menys del que hem estat fent fins ara els científics en la política? Um, so, first of all, you know, what are the things... It's since the time of Galileo and probably before... I mean, I hadn't appreciated it, but, you know, Galileo was doing his work in part because of military applications as well. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't a new thing. It, um, that's where funding is often, and that's what happens. Um, so it's, it's a sad but true thing that a lot of the great scientific developments happen. And even, um, you know, there were a couple with business interests or something that sometimes have good effects, sometimes have bad effects. Um, I think s certainly s scientists have an obligation to sort of say what they know in, in part in terms of how it can feed public opinion. And one time I was actually asked, uh, I don't know if you know CNN, had asked me to be on a debate about climate change with someone who is more a denier. And they said, we want someone, and I don't work on climate change. In this book I talk a little bit about climate change, but at that time I never thought of, about it scientifically. I mean, I thought about it as a, as a citizen. And they said, we want a scientist who's neutral And I, and, I, that doesn't and I said, you should have a scientist who works on this topic. The fact that they have an opinion at this point because their research showed them something doesn't mean they're not neutral. It mm -hmm. means they're good scientists. Mm -hmm. And the idea that if there's a scientific result, it's considered an opinion is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be clear, you know, what the results are. And I do think that, um, you know, but as you know, with scientific issues, part of it is the scientists, but really it becomes politics. When science is used badly, it's rarely the scientists that are saying, let's use this for evil military purposes. I mean, maybe in movies, they're the evil scientist. But usually it's politicians who want to take advantage of science for mm -hmm. um, purposes that the scientists didn't intend it. Um, so I don't know how to correct that balance, and it's certainly to the extent that scientists can get involved. I think one of the problems with science getting involved, at least in the United States these days, is it ends up becoming technology and business, um, which isn't always a bad thing, but it's still not science. And I think we see basic science hurting because of that. Mm -hmm. So I think to the extent that scientists can have a voice, it's very important. But it's not always the scientists themselves who are keeping themselves quiet. It's the politicians, too. Mm -hmm. Un tema que també volia tocar amb la doctora Randall és el tema de la igualtat de gènere dins de la ciència. Perquè, per exemple, dins del seu currículum apareix que eh, el fet que va ser la primera eh, professora catedràtica Actually, de física... I don't say that in my CV. Other people say it. <laughs> ah, no, no. Bé, de tota manera. Eh, jo recordo que, per exemple, quan jo estudiava, ja fa uns quants anys, eh, la carrera de física només hi havia dues dones entre 30 estudiants al meu curs. Suposo que eh, en el seu cas potser no era aquest nivell, i ara, doncs, continuen sent franca minoria. És a dir, ha augmentat, però continuen sent franca minoria. Aleshores, dona la sensació que això és una cosa que li costa moltíssim de canviar, no? Hi ha altres camps, eh, com les matemàtiques, que, que potser ha canviat més que no pas la física. És com si la física eh, tingués una aureola més propera a la tecnologia i aleshores aquí ja toquem uns temes de 
educacionals, etcètera, etcètera. Voldria saber l'opinió de, precisament, una dona científica que ha arribat tan alt, perquè, d'altra banda, han de ser conscients vostès que si ja hi ha menys dones estudiant físiques, per exemple, a mesura que anem augmentant el nivell, o sigui, de doctorat, de places de professor ordinari, de professors catedràtics, de directors de grup, el conus es va fent cada cop més petit. Com creu vostè que hauríem de de millorar d'una forma molt més decidida aquesta tendència? That's a good question. I should say, you know, actually, Spain is remarkable for the number, at least, of good theoretical physicists who are women. And actually, Belen Gavella at Madrid runs a big European Union consortium. Mm -hmm. And I do think, and there are many women involved in it. It's actually really impressive, and they're, they're very talented. And I think um, one of the ways actually is what the European Union has done in this case, which is, I mean, it's not this specifically for women. I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's on um, dark matter and neutrinos, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think half-jokingly she called it invisibles. Mm -hmm. which um, is pretty amusing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is a large part women, but it's not entirely women by any means. But I think this really does make a difference. I think, you know, just she herself has had several good women students, and I think that's part of why there are so many. So, it, you know, it doesn't even take necessarily that many people, but you have to support them. I mean, you know, it's fine for me to do my work, but if I'm not supported, I can't have as much of an influence. And I think that that is actually, I mean, it sounds so basic. and. You know, and the other thing is, of course, you don't want to be doing it just because people are women, but you don't want to not do it. And I think a lot of the time people don't even realize that they're assuming that, you know, the women can't run this organization. Mm -hmm. um, not because they're worse, but there's all sorts of excuses. They don't get along or whatever. There's strong personality. Of course, if you find women, they're going to have strong personalities. It happens to be true of the men as well. So I think you have to think harder about how people are being judged and when you make decisions like this, because in the end, it, it does matter who's in charge and who's supported and all of this. And of course, you know, from, from the point of view of students and individuals, they just have to believe they can do it. Um, the fact that there aren't as many doesn't mean, the numbers actually weren't that different from what you described when I was a student. In fact, mm -hmm. there were some classes, I was the only woman who took the final exam in the end. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, that, I didn't think that was a reason not to do it. I, mm -hmm. it, it didn't, um, but I, but, in a way, you know, people can be too aware and it becomes so much of an issue that people forget that they're, you know, it's almost like one of the reasons I hesitate when people say you're the first woman is because sometimes they forget that you're actually doing the best science too. Somehow it looks like it's this other category. And, um, you know, sadly we're seeing that in the presidential election in America. You can see how it helps Hillary, but it hurts her too, that, you know. And, um, I mean, there's many issues, but it's clear that that's an issue. And I think that People have to just really think about how they're evaluating, but also, you know, on the other hand, the women who are doing it just have to go ahead and just do it. Perquè ara està, jo diria, de moda, no sé si és la paraula adequada, intentar corregir aquesta tendència a base de quotes. Quotes, per exemple, de dones en els tribunals o les comissions, etcètera, etcètera. No tinc clar que això sigui positiu, perquè si arribés un dia que gairebé ens obliguessin a ser tantes dones com homes, doncs aleshores les dones que ocuparien aquests càrrecs igual estarien com devaluades perquè la gent pensaria no, no tenen el talent, però els han obligat. Com a Estats Units també s'ha trobat una mica amb aquesta problemàtica a l'hora, per exemple, d'intentar corregir les diferències amb els pobles afroamericans, o llatinoamericans per promoure el seu accés a la universitat. Creu vostè que és una línia que ajuda o que pot, com deia jo, ser negativa? So, quotes are tricky, and I agree with you, and they don't always work. I have to say, it has been interesting to see, not just in a science context, but I think it's Germany where they required some fraction of board members to be women. And, um, and so they went from having none to having quite a few. And it's been very successful. Like they've done a great job. Mm -hmm. So 
I think there are times when you can measure it and you can see that, you know, it's, it's not that the women had less quality, they just weren't being put on. And so there are times it just works, that, you know, there's such hesitation. And, uh, and unless you change the numbers dramatically, it doesn't work. If you have just one, it, it, then the, it, the voice is harder. If you have two, it's a lot easier. So, I mean, I, I understand that perspective, and in many ways I, I respect that. I don't know the answer. I, it's interesting to see what's happened with diversity at, at Harvard. Um, so, for example, this came up with student admission. It was recently um, at Harvard. And I think it isn't described as a quota. It's described in terms of diversity. You know, so you're looking for other qualities. And if you think about it, there, you know, when you accept students, it is true. There are many, many other qualifications that come into play. It's not just who was the best student academically. It might be sports. It might be an alumni. Uh, it might be some activity they did. So it, when it becomes just one other factor, then at least it makes you pay attention more to those people. I mean, really, to the extent that it's just correcting things, um, it's not a bad thing. But if you can do it in a way that isn't explicitly a quota, I think that's better. When you realize the benefits from or what you're losing by not allowing this to happen. Molt bé. Doncs bé, crec que podem passar al segon bloc perquè si no al final no ens haurem de guardar unes quantes preguntes. El segon bloc era sobre el pensament científic, o sigui, com diu el nostre amic Jorge Wagensberg, i suposo que no és l'únic en dir-ho, hi ha, diguéssim, pensaments de tres grans menes, el pensament científic basat en el raonament inductiu i deductiu, el pensament diguéssim, artístic, basat en l'inspiració, el sentiment i el pensament de tipus religiós, basat en la revelació, la fe i fins i tot el dogma, cosa que ja no és tan agradable. I malgrat que siguin tres tipus diferents, doncs a la pràctica existeixen relacions, a vegades d'amor, a vegades d'odi, no?, entre aquests tres tipus. Aleshores, per exemple, m'agradaria començar per la relació entre ciència i art, perquè, bé, des de l'època dels grecs ja van ser els primers a adonar-se que les simetries, l'estètica, guardava una relació molt important amb l'estructura o amb la composició de l'univers. I això, doncs jo crec que ha arribat ja a uns límits extraordinaris amb les teories més modernes de la física de partícules. Què em podria dir a aquest respecte? Que sé que per als llibres que li he llegit... So, actually, in my previous book, Knocking on Heaven's Door, I actually had a couple of chapters where I really talked about the relationship between precisely these things, science and artistic and religious thinking. And also, I talk about the role of symmetry as well. <laughs> and um, so, as far as the first part goes, I mean, I think that we're asking different questions in each of these arenas. Um, I think science is really asking how the world works. I think art really is much more from a human perspective. I mean, science, you know, true science, we want to get the human out of it. That's not to say, I mean, there could be science of how humans work, but I mean that we don't want to be influenced by the fact that we're people studying this. We want to have an objective view of, of what's really going on. Um, the questions we ask, of course, will probably be determined by the fact that we're human beings because that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. But we like to think that the answers go beyond that. Mm -hmm. I think with the arts, it's really about humans dealing with the world, how we see it, the emotional reaction. So it, it's, very, it's very different in that respect. And I think one of the interesting arenas these days, and that's one of the reasons we did this opera, is to, to say how can, you know, art reflects cultural influences of all, all sorts, including scientific. Um, so I think that's interesting as well. I think religion, um, people mean different things with religion. Sometimes it's really just a social or psychological thing of how people approach the world. And sometimes it's trying to say objective things about the world, and then it's a completely different thing. Um, so, as for, so I do think um, they are quite different. And I think sometimes people try to, apologists try to, you know, say that things are the same, but they're not the same, and it's important. But it's also, but it's the same desires, it's the same similar questions, and it's, it was very interesting for me to try to isolate exactly where um, they branch out. 
And you had a second question, which I forgot. I've read. What was the second part of the question? Mm, la relació entre les simetries i... Uh, symmetry, yes. Um, so, you know, it's funny. Everyone says how, you know, symmetry is beautiful. But, um, you know, we're in this building here. It's very unsymmetric. Um, <laughs> and it's really beautiful. <laughs> I think um, one of the really interesting things that science does, that art does, is figure out you know, it's orderly enough that we're comfortable with it, but it breaks it in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's actually one of the big things that science does. It says, you know, the world is not completely orderly. In fact, mm -hmm. it's a big mess. But can you identify underlying order and then the small things that break that symmetry? And I think that's what makes things truly, truly beautiful. Sí, fins i tot. De vegades penso que potser hi ha una relació molt profunda de l'estil que ens agrada a allò que més o menys està dins de la norma, i la norma és la regla o, o la llei de la natura, no? I, I trobem lleig allò que s'aparta de les normes, etc. És a dir, que igual en el cervell hi ha una connexió entre lògica i estètica que, que potser s'anirà veient més clar en el futur, no? No ho sé. I think, I think we as human beings, you know, we need order because we can mm -hmm. only, frankly, remember so many things. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the reasons we like music is because mm -hmm. it, it sticks in our head. It's, mm -hmm. it's easy to take with us. And it's one of the reasons symmetry is so striking because you don't mm -hmm. need as many things to describe what's going on. Because mm -hmm. if you know what's happening here, you know what's happening there. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, that's also boring. And so I think uh, the world is much more interesting as is art. And so I think it's, you know, it's always a little bit of a fight. And, you know, and over time, it's really interesting to see um, how our, our aesthetic views have changed. Um, we don't always think the same things are beautiful. We don't always think the same music is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you can uh, identify some of the same principles. Mm -hmm. Respecte a la religió, mm, ciència religió, que estava, estarem tots d'acord que el científic més val que treballi sense pensar en les religions. Uh, Quan jo estudiava el doctorat, eh, recordo eh, que en el meu despatx hi havia una persona que deia que llegia el Corán precisament per inspirar-se en la recerca del dia següent. No? I jo pensava, ui, doncs més val mantenir-ho molt apartat una cosa de l'altra. Mm. Però, evidentment, eh, igual que el científic de la seva... How did he do as a scientist? Eh, què faig jo? The person who read the Corán. Eh, I don't know. I think... He... I think he abandoned, okay. really. I'm curious. Doncs, o sigui, deia que crec que va abandonar, eh? però no li ha seguit el, el seu de lloc. <laughs> Doncs, però, eh, ja parlant més seriosament, evidentment tots tenim les nostres idees eh, religioses, que pot ser o creure o no creure, o, o ser agnòstic, etc. etc. I aquest respecte existeix, eh, sembla ser un, unes estadístiques interessants que diuen que dintre dels científics els que menys creuen en Déu eh, són els científics de la branca de la medicina i de la genètica i de la bio, no? Perquè amb això de la genètica doncs, es veure de que tot seguia i que la necessitat d'un Déu creador de, dels seres vius doncs, realment no calia. No? Però a l'altre extrem tot i que em sembla que no passen tampoc del 50% els creients, a l'altre extrem sembla ser que hi ha els cosmòlegs o els astrònoms. És a dir, que mm, sembla que aquesta gent, entre la qual estic jo, <laughs> però no es tracta de saber la meva opinió al respecte, eh, hi ha eh, l'opinió de que... Però tu should say. <laughs> Bé, ho diré, ho diré, però després de vostè. Eh, sí, jo, jo em mullaré, jo em mullaré. Eh, sí, la idea aquesta de que mm, el fet de que existeixi quelcom. Eh? I he llegit en algun del, dels seus llibres, precisament, un argument que em va frapar molt, que va dir, no, en realitat, el fet de que existeixi quelcom és, de fet, més probable que no, que no existeixi res. O sigui que eh, fins i tot el fet de que existeixi quelcom, i quelcom seriós, amb lleis, eh, o sigui, amb conservacions, etc., etc., eh, no té per què eh, aproximar-nos a la idea d'un ser 
bla, bla, bla. Perquè, clar, depèn del bla que hi posem, la meva contesta serà d'un tipus o d'un altre, després en parlarem, en tot cas. Però podria elaborar una mica més aquesta resposta que és més probable que existeixi quelcom que no, que no existeixi res, perquè a mi em fa... Ok, so first of all, just to be clear, so your idea of religion is bla, bla, bla. Just that's what I understand. Ok. Ok. You know, it's funny. So, I was saying it half-jokingly, but not so much jokingly. You know, the fact is, there's all these big questions, no matter how you answer them, the answer is unsatisfying. Should there be something? Should there be nothing? Is the universe infinite? Is the universe finite? Has the last... I mean, no matter what answer you give, it's, it's unsatisfying because mm. it's just beyond what we really mm. know and can think of. Um, for me, it, it is more satisfying to think of an infinite universe that's lived forever, that may have different parts that emerge. Um, as far as the question of something versus nothing, first of all, it's obvious we wouldn't be asking the question if there weren't something, so that sort of makes the question moot in some ways. But the, my somewhat half-joking, but not really joking argument is, I think nothing is really special. I mean, the natural state is to have something. I mean, if you think of a, a number line, I mean, zero is a very, very special mm -hmm. point. It's one point out of infinite, or infinity of infinities. So something is not that special. And then if you had a reason that you would have zero, that you would have something, well, that's something. <laughs> you can't have a reason without there being some order to the system. Mm -hmm. So it's just hard for me to imagine a system where nothing is the natural state. Yes, yes. 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 But, you know, I also want to focus on the questions we can make progress on. Doncs jo diria que és que el problema és assignar-li a l'idea de Déu tots aquests bla 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 que dèiem abans. O sigui, l'idea de la consciència, la voluntat, etcètera, etcètera. Clar, si l'anem fent antropomòrfic al màxim, doncs aleshores, evidentment, no val la pena, des del punt de vista meu, creure en una cosa d'aquest estil. Ara, si parlem de l'existència d'alguna cosa al mateix univers, doncs aleshores potser ja ens podríem arribar a posar d'acord. O sigui, bé, això per alguna altra ocasió. No sé si... What did I just agree to? Bé, doncs... Com no hem vingut aquí per escoltar la meva opinió... Passarem a una altra qüestió. Com és el progrés científic? Abans ha sortit ja un tema força interessant, que és el fet que, a diferència del coneixement a l'època del Renaixement, que era possible abarcar una mica tota la gama de coneixements de l'època científics i fins i tot tecnològics, avui dia ha esdevingut impossible. És a dir, que els científics treballen en camps molt especialitzats. Aleshores, crec que ens n'hem adonat que ens estem perdent alguna cosa important. I ara es parla molt del pensament interdisciplinari o del treball interdisciplinari entre científics de diferents branques. De fet, el llibre aquest n'és un bon exemple, com tindreu ocasió de veure si el compreu i el llegiu. Aleshores, m'agradaria saber si ens convé les dues coses o ens convé més una que l'altra. És a dir, tendir cap a aprofundir molt en uns coneixements, perquè cada cop és més difícil avançar sense aprofundir, o deixar-ho una mica de banda, o compaginar els dos al màxim? So, I think both are important. You know, it depends on the question you're asking. I mean, there are some things that we do in cosmology and particle physics that we couldn't do without a great degree of specialization. But, you know, I look at 
for example, Harvard has, I don't even know the number of biology departments, there's probably 10 biology departments if you put together at least the medical school and the very good school, because every time they find some new technique or new way of thinking in biology, it's a new department, which means students actually have to choose which one they're doing. And then, and then you find another one which becomes you know, systems biology, so you put it together in the end. I mean, in some ways, biology should be one field. Right? We're trying to understand living things, you're looking at it from different perspectives, you combine together knowledge. I mean, physics is one field. I mean, we sometimes separate astronomy and cosmology, but we do it as one field. So at least, I mean, if we were biology, it would be an interdisciplinary thing because we have so many different ways of approaching these problems. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are some questions, like one of the reasons I loved the story of the extinction of the dinosaurs, which we can talk more about, was the way they put together the information, not just, you know, just to figure out what had happened. Combining together physics, paleontology, ast uh, astronomy at some level, um, different chemistry, nuclear physics, you know, combine together all these different fields in order to really figure out what went on. So sometimes you have these detective problems that really require many different inputs. And sometimes you miss things because we don't think about it. And so sometimes interdisciplinary is very well motivated. Um, I think, you know, understanding biological systems is almost certainly going to require some forms of physics and chemistry. But, you know, just like with quotas, if you artificially impose interdisciplinarity, you don't necessarily mm -hmm. get anywhere. Mm -hmm. It has to sort of happen more organically that mm -hmm. there's a reason to be doing it and you really need expertise in different fields. And even for me, I mean, uh, you know, from some perspectives, this might not be called interdisciplinary, but, you know, I'm a particle physicist, but now I'm working on dark matter. And it turns out the type of work I'm doing involves astronomy a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's very useful for me to be talking to astronomers who are trained very mm -hmm. differently than, than I'm trained. And sometimes they'll disagree and sometimes we'll provide a perspective for them they didn't have. And very often they'll tell us things that we didn't know about. So I think um, you know, there's just some big questions that are just hard and they require different perspectives. And other times that's not the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> També es diu que una forma segura d'equivocar-se és fer prediccions de futur respecte a la ciència. És a dir, que ja, ja preparo, no? de que ens podem equivocar de mig a mig. Però m'agradaria eh, preguntar-li a la doctora Randall eh, què creu vostè que pot arribar a ser els grans eh, avenços en el segle XXI a nivell científic en general i ja més concretament a nivell de física. You know, a lot of that's going to depend on what, frankly, what we decide to fund, because very few breakthroughs happen without, um, without technological development, without mm -hmm. experiments to support it. Um, there might be theoretical developments, but, um, and there certainly will be, but I think we really need to have it in conjunction with experiments. And, and it worries me, I don't know what we're going to see. Um, I, I'm optimistic that we will know a lot more about dark matter, um, the nature of dark matter, this invisible matter in the universe that carries five times the energy of what we know about, but we don't know what its nature is. We see its gravitational influence on other things, but we don't know fundamentally what it is. And I think we're about to learn more. Doesn't mean we will necessarily discover it, but we will certainly learn more about it. Um, I think there are, there is some chance we'll know more about black holes. Um, there's, it's being approached from many different directions, so I think there's some optimism there. Um, in terms of particle physics, it probably will depend a lot on whether we build another higher energy machine. If we do, we will learn quite a bit about the underlying structure of matter. Um, and I don't know how far the Large Hadron Collider with its limited energy reach will actually go. Um, so, and then of course there are other fields of physics. Um, you know, we probably will make advances in quantum information, for example. Um, so th that's probably what I would say for now. I fora de la física, creu, per exemple, que s'arribarà a poder eh, eh, arribar a l'immortalitat, per exemple, o a l'intel·ligència artificial? O, és, o són temes dels quals se'n parla molt, però que mai s'arribarà perquè serà una mena de síndota? So, um, I almost certainly think robotics will advance. That's very different than artificial intelligence, but I think robotics will advance quite a bit. And I think... Um, in terms of medical devices that where you can replace limbs by mechanical things. I think physical things will almost certainly advance um, that require technology. Um, artificial intelligence, I mean, I think is a little bit overhyped. Um, 
you know, we've made a lot of advances, but a lot of those advances have come about because computing power has advanced so much and just allows you to explore, and so algorithms exploit that. In terms of really, really key developments, um, th those are yet to come. Um, so there's some real possibility. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of time ahead of us. There's some real possibility we will make such advances. Um, I do think that just in term, just the same way like mechanical devices can replace you, like there will be some functional things that certainly will be replaced. And it will change the nature of science because it, you know, mm -hmm. even from the time I started doing science to now, I mean, computers play a much bigger role. I mean, mm -hmm. and it changes the way we think about things. It changes what we feel we can do. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just at visiting the astronomy department. My friend of mine, who's actually an artist, I, I never was a scientist, he's working on the glass plates. So, you know, the original plates that they took. And, you know, to see one of those things, you know, the amount of time they spent on that, and they can do that, you know, in a second now to get that information. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes they still use those to compare because it's been such a long time period. So certainly having these techniques advanced is definitely going to change the nature of things. Um, will we fundamentally develop artificial intelligence? I, I don't know. I, I don't even know what that means, actually. Molt bé. Doncs passem al tercer bloc, el de més connectat al llibre, aquest últim que ha escrit la professora Randall. Bé, no voldria fer cap spoiler, però es tracta de connectar la física de partícules concretament en el camp de la matèria fosca. Només diré que la matèria fosca sabem que existeix perquè es manifesta, diguéssim, gravitacionalment. Doncs la matèria fosca amb l'estructura de les galàxies i l'evolució de l'univers, que a la seva vegada es manifesten amb la dinàmica dels sistemes planetaris i això pot acabar influint amb l'evolució de la vida. És a dir, que realment és un llibre molt bonic perquè lliga des de la cosmologia, passant per la física de partícules, a l'evolució de la vida i que acaba sent vida intel·ligent, perquè si no haguessin desaparegut els dinosaures, bé, possiblement serien... els dinosaures serien els que haurien ocupat el nostre lloc, no? En tot cas, aquest tema de la matèria fosca m'agradaria preguntar-li si realment creu que l'única sortida és que existeixi matèria fosca o bé com també s'està investigant, perquè ho investiguem tots els científics, no ens donem mai per perduts. O bé és més aviat la teoria gravitacional actual, la relativitat general d'Einstein, la que convindria retocar-se una mica. So, I do think it's dark matter, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily the only possibility. Um, I hesitate always to say those things because we can always think of something else, potentially. Um, in the case of dark matter, you know, first of all, there's no reason it shouldn't exist. Um, the idea that all matter is just the same stuff we're made of, I mean, why should that be the case? I mean, the idea, I mean it seems perfectly obvious that there should be other matter that isn't necessarily made up of atoms, that doesn't necessarily interact with light. I, in fact, the more mysterious thing to me is why we have as much of the energy of the universe as we do, about 5% or, or you know, 20% or 15% of, of the total matter energy. Mm -hmm. and that's quite significant. And you know, like, uh, we know the universe is a big place and it has a lot of stuff in it. So I find that amazing. So there's really no reason. So there's nothing radical about dark matter at all. It's really, you know, we don't see it. So for, you know, again, from our very limited perspective, we're shocked. We're like, how can it not be like us? But many things aren't like us. That's not so surprising. So I, um, and I think it's far less radical than thinking that the theory of relativity is is wrong or changed. Or, mm -hmm. and even if it does change, it would have to change at these scales we're really seeing. So it's certainly worth investigating. And you know, every once in a while, I'll do that myself. You know, think mm -hmm. how can we explain some of these funny relationships? Um, but it's hard to believe that those are more likely. Um, and on top of that, I think one thing that, one of the pieces of evidence for dark matter, I just find it really hard to see how changing the equations is going to do it, which is something called, it's the bullet cluster and other clusters. So a cluster of galaxies is, it's a group of galaxies, it's a lot of galaxies together. And the bullet cluster shows evidence that it was the merging of at least two different clusters of galaxies. 
And these clusters of galaxies, they have galaxies in them, obviously, which is to say that you know they have stars and gas and dark matter. And what you see when you look at this is that the gas gets stuck in the middle because the gas is interacting, whereas the dark matter goes through, and you see that because of the gravitational influence of the dark matter. So it's hard to imagine just changing the equation of motion. I mean, this is exactly what you would expect for something that's dark matter. It just goes through, it doesn't interact, and it ends up in the so of course we're going to test that as well as we can. We want to think about are there explanations, but that seems very compelling evidence to me for dark matter. M'agrada molt la resposta, però jo em dedico a això també. O sigui que coincidí. Jo com a astrofísic, ella com a física de partícules. Ara bé, des de fa uns quants anys sembla que el descobriment de la matèria fosca o de les partícules que composen la matèria fosca és una cosa imminent. I va passant el temps i no arribem a trobar-les. Creu que realment és una cosa molt propera, la detecció de partícules de matèria fosca? So, um, this is something that is very misleading, the way it's presented. Because people talk about the discovery of dark matter, but when they say the discovery of dark matter as a particle, they mean something very particular, which is a particle that somehow related in some sense to the Higgs boson. That it's you know, what we call a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. It's a particular type of dark matter particle. It's motivated by the amount of energy it has. If there was a particle with mass about the same as the Higgs mass, you would have the right amount of energy carried by dark matter if it was stable. But that doesn't mean it's right. But if it is right, it means that there's some chance that even though it doesn't interact a lot with light, it could interact a little bit with the standard model so we can see it. So when people say they're searching for dark matter, they're really searching for this one particular candidate. And it is true, if it was this type of dark matter, they should have found it or they should find it within the next 10 years. As, as a theoretical physicist, one of the things I'm doing because I think there could be many other possibilities and what if they don't find it within 10 years? So what we're thinking about is what are the other possibilities for what dark matter can be and are, are there even indirect ways that we can tell more about its nature? Mm -hmm. So there's so many possibilities for dark matter that will be undetectable. But if it has any kind of interesting properties, maybe we can detect that. Mm -hmm. And so th I think it's just an important scientific question. Mm -hmm. Sí, precisament uh, una proposta de, de la doctora Ram del seu equip és que uh, la matèria fosca també interacciona o també podria interaccionar entre ella mateixa eh, i que hi hagués doncs, uh, la partícula equivalent als fotons entre la matèria bariònica ordinària, en el cas de la matèria fosca, el que anomenen ells els fotons foscos. No? I eh, és divertit perquè en algun moment del llibre eh, fa una petita insinuació que, que és molt divertida, m'agradaria que, que l'elaborés una mica més, que és que, clar, de la mateixa manera, si existeix fotons foscos, doncs vol dir que existeix com una interacció electromagnètica fosca, que és a la base de la química, és a dir, que hi hauria una química fosca, i si existeix una química fosca i existeix altres interaccions fosques capaços d'aturar el col·lapse de la matèria fosca amb, amb objectes eh, forats negres, és a dir, que podrien existir estrelles fosques, amb, amb química fosca que podria donar lloc a vida fosca, i si un m'apura, amb vida intel·ligent fosca. És a dir, que podríem estar... Eh, a més, és molt divertit, perquè la matèria fosca, de fet, està per aquí, dins de la galàxia. No? Eh, suposo que hi ha pensat, no?, vostè amb aquesta elucubració. Um, well, certainly, you know, as, as an intellectual exercise I have, and, um, and you might note that I also very quickly say we're not going to talk about this because it's so far from what we can detect. I mean, the thing is, if there were dark life, it would be undetectable at this point. It would be very hard to know about it. And so it's quite, po I mean, if there were radiation associated with dark stuff, we don't detect that radiation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for us to think about how limited what we can observe is at this point and to think about ways of going beyond it. And the fact that it sounds ridiculous doesn't mean it's not possible. It just sounds ridiculous because we've never seen it before and we don't know. On the other hand, I will acknowledge that life is a very complicated thing. Um, and you know, just having a photon won't be enough. You would need some more complicated system. I mean, there are some very accidental seeming relationships that give rise to life in our universe. And um, one of the things I wanted to explore in this book was just what are these accidents? You know, what are the things that 
Um, that doesn't mean there couldn't be other forms of life that we don't know about yet. But for our form of life, there are very particular relations that, w that seem to be required. And so I just, th I just think it's interesting to speculate, although very hard <laughs> to detect, mm -hmm. even though it's right here. Uh, sí, precisament hem avançat molt amb la, uh, amb el, la comprensió de l'estructura de l'univers, de les partícules, uh, de l'evolució mateixa de l'univers, i, i aquí tenim la vida, que, que estem bastant estancats i que uh, des de fa molt de temps estem amb el dilema de si s'ha generat a la Terra gairebé com un bolet o si... Uh, de fet, hi ha hagut una mena de panespèrmia uh, perquè existeix evidència de que existeixen uh, molècules molt complexes, prebiòtiques, una mica per tot l'univers. Uh, vostè creu més aviat aquesta segona possibilitat o, o realment ho veu molt obert? So, you know, it's funny. Um, so, I talked a lot to my colleagues when I, you know, who think about these things when I was writing this book. Um, and you know, their interpretation, at least for some of them, is, is exactly the opposite. It, it shows that life is just likely, not necessarily life, but some of these molecules that enter life. I mean, there is organic matter throughout the universe, what we call organic matter. I mean, organic just means carbon-based. It doesn't mean it's alive. And, there's, you know, and it's actually very common. You know, we're talking about organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, but organic stuff is everywhere throughout the universe. So you can say, well, maybe that means it came from somewhere else, but Probably the simplest possibility, I hate to admit it, is just it came from here. Um, that's not to say that it, we don't have interactions with the universe. And, you know, for example, we have to be close enough to the sun that we get radiation and that water can be liquid, but we have to be far enough away that the radiation doesn't kill off the light. We have to be far enough from the rest of the stars that it doesn't kill it off. We have to have big outer planets that knock things away so that they, we don't constantly get bombarded with asteroids. So we definitely have relationships to the solar system. It doesn't mean that things necessarily came from elsewhere, although there are mysteries of where carbon came from, where water came from. And so these are all super interesting questions, but um, you know, it sounds very exotic to say, well, life developed somewhere else and came here. Mm -hmm. But you know, actually, the Earth has a very good place to develop life, <laughs> it turns out. So it's probably likely it started here, too. Anava a fer-li la pregunta si creia que era molt comuna la vida a la galàxia i més o menys amb la resposta aquesta eh, ha, ha quedat clar. Eh, mm, tenia una pregunta molt d'actualitat preparada, que és eh, el seu llibre anterior, es diu Knocking on the Heaven's Door. Eh, suposo que era en honor a un dels, eh, de les cançons famoses de Bob Dylan. So, um, I mean, it, it's really, you know, the, I, if you saw my first book too, I tend to misappropriate quotes from songs because they stick in your head and it's kind of fun and it makes you think about it. So what I meant by it was very different what he meant by it. Mm -hmm. um, what I meant was sort of this idea that we try to go beyond what we know and try to, you know, we have this knowledge that we have and then we try to get beyond it. So it was just a playful way of referring to that. But it is very funny because, you know, you, you find out how old people are when you ask them these things because either they know from Bob Dylan or they know from Guns N' Roses or they think about what it really means in terms of what the song was about. So, um, so it was just kind of having fun with it. Li puc preguntar si en aquesta, diguéssim, discussió de si és merescut o no merescut el Premi Nobel de Literatura al Bob Dylan, què en pensa vostè? You know, I have to say, <laughs> the Nobel Prize is always a mystery in, every, in a lot of fields. Um, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> is like has a horrible history of uh, predicting where things will go badly. Um, so, um, you know, I think, you know, it's controversial. I mean, I think, I don't have a strong opinion. I think, you know, he certainly was a great songwriter, you know, and that's a kind of literature. I, you know, was he a poet? No, he was a songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and should literature include that? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, but I think the debates are kind of funny. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and some people you know, would say, look, you know, he wins awards for songwriting, so this is an award for writing, for mm -hmm. literature, 
for poetry and fiction or whatever. So mm -hmm. we would rather see somebody re rewarded who, who does that. Um, but, you know, if you pick out any individual, I'm not sure I could justify. I mean, it's such an enormous range of people, so I don't feel like I'm qualified to say whether or not someone deserves it. I mean, I can certainly see reasons in both directions. All right. What do you think? Uh, I don't have... <laughs> Pardon. Uh, no tengo una opinión clara al respecto. <laughs> Soy muy diplomático. No, a mí me parece positivo, más que nada, para sacsejar una mica el sistema, ¿no? O sea, per, per crear, precisamente, polémicas y que lo mejor abre unos nuevos puntos de vista. Uh, para acabar... Si uh... ganas el Physics Prize, eso será raro. Exactamente, exactamente. Sí, uh... <laughs> para acabar, uh, quería comentar que un de los temas que realmente es... Uh muy difíciles de abordar a nivel de divulgación es explicar de una forma eh, clara, quizás de hecho no es pugui, no ho sé, eh, la física cuántica. Eh, de hecho, eh, parece ser que Niels Bohr, a menos que no sea eh, una falsa eh, leyenda, el Niels Bohr eh, parece ser que un día va a decir que si alguien le dice que entén la física cuántica, vol dir que no entén res. A las horas eh, Creo que es pot arribar a explicar toda esta cuestión de, de, de la superposición de estados, de los estados entre lligats, de una partícula, etc., etc., de una manera que, que podem entender fins i tot los físicos, porque me explico una mica, ¿no? O sea, la física, al menos, es la visión que yo tengo, y si la profesora Randall tiene una otra visión, le agradezco que lo diga. Eh, sobre todo el que veiem es cómo funciona, ¿no? pero eh, entre una mica en contradicción amb la lógica diguéssim que tenim eh, més adaptada al món macroscòpic, no? És a dir, hi han, hi han uns aspectes de, de la física quàntica que sabem que es comporten així, però no no podem dir que, el, que els entenguem estrictament, almenys segons la meva humil eh, experiència, no? Eh, creo que és possible, doncs So I think, you know, we're actually asking the wrong question a lot of the time. Um, because when we think, what we mean by understanding is we mean to understand in classical terms, to understand in the terms that we're familiar with on the scales we live in. It turns out quantum mechanics is much richer. Um, in a limit, it can behave like classical physics, but there are many things that go beyond what classical physics can do. You know, it's like, I mean, I know five words <coughs> of Spanish. If I tried to translate everything I know into Spanish, I would be very unsuccessful. And that's what translating quantum mechanics into classical mechanics is. I can translate all of my Spanish into English with no problem. <laughs> I have a much richer vocabulary there. And quantum mechanics is in many ways a richer vocabulary. So mm -hmm. I think we're asking the wrong question. Molt bé, doncs moltes gràcies. Ho deixarem aquí. Si algú de vostès vol aconseguir alguna assignatura de la profesora Randall, doncs ara tindrà ocasió. Espero que no hi hagi multitud, perquè si no, doncs quedarà eh, la pobra. I, I bé, m'agradaria acabar eh, agraint-li molt a la doctora Randall la seva presència i aquesta conversa tan agradable que hem mantingut i desitjar-li que tingui tan èxit amb aquest darrer llibre com ha tingut amb els anteriors, si no més. Muchas gracias. Can I also thank you? I, I really enjoyed that interview. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you.